when you decided to do this, you have to take a, a, a absence from your day job, or, or how much time did you think that this was going to take you? I basically did it all together at the same time. The, one of the great things about working at the New York Times is that I could do little pieces along the way. So right. I did a I before the book I did a, a Yachty story, I did a Migo story, I did a QC as a label story. That was sort of the basis of the book, along with a, a few other things here and there. And then, for instance, I did an interview with Lil Baby when my turn came out, February 2020. I went there i did a q a with him but i had way more than i put in the paper so i saved the rest of it mm. uh you know i did an offset solo story when he put out his solo album in in that in that moment uh and that allowed me to go to the tour with drake and you know see them see them do their hometown show which becomes a big part of the book that i barely wrote about at the time but i was able to sort of store the the information so i was just reporting for years so basically you know thinking back 2017 to 2020 i was just gathering information Mm. And then when I actually sit down and wrote it, I happened to take four months of unpaid book leave from right. the Times, and it, it was February to June of 2020, Right. coincidentally. And then I sit down to write the book, and all of a sudden, everything's shut down, and I had mm. literally nothing else to do right. but tie together all these years of material. Right. That must have been pretty convenient. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't think I would have gotten it done without COVID. But how difficult was the access for you to pull off? Because rappers are you know, traditionally very difficult to wrangle to spend time with they definitely are not operating on the hours that you would probably prefer to be working the two things that helped are one the new york times just opens doors mm, having true. an yeah. at ny times email account people just respond to you right that that's it means something to people who don't even read the New York Times in mm -hmm. the same way that a Rolling Stone does or maybe a No Jumper these days. You know, like right. people just get that that's a brand. So that so the access is there on on that end. The other thing is that I started reporting on people who weren't famous. Mm. I Marlo never really became famous. So right. when I would come down to Atlanta, you know, I had a relationship with QC and their people. And I would say, hey, let Marlo know I'm coming to town. And he would just come pick me up and we would just drive around for a normal day. Mm. And to me, you could could learn more about a person just rolling around going to the mall and hanging out and going to a barbecue going to the barber shop than if we were to sit down at a fancy hotel and like have a lunch and have an hour of of question answer question answer i just right. wanted to see how these guys lived and then someone like lil reek who's to me, as important of a character in the book as anybody famous. It tells a very important story that, to be honest, like you humanized it in a way that I don't really get to see because I I never interviewed Lil Reek, but if I had, it probably would have been like 2018. When right at kind the of, moment. Yeah, and then I probably would have not really ever heard of him from besides maybe seeing some tweets or something along the way. And, you know, that the sort of picture that you paint of him just sort of being lonely and feeling kind of useless and not really knowing what to do with himself after he's, he's had this flirtation with fame he can't just go get a day job or anything but at the same time he has nothing in front of him that he's going to really be able to monetize with except his creativity and you yeah. hope that a kid like that will continue going at it and trying over again because you've seen guys not make it the first time or the second time but then something hits on the third or fourth but to me that was an important story to tell because mm. especially in this streaming gold rush where just like in Seattle after Nirvana hit all the major labels come swooping in and they just throwing money around and they mm. want to sign anyone who has any connection to anyone who's vaguely famous and I think Lil Reek was probably a a product of that era where you have an ambitious producer like Bradinsky who essentially like sees him and thinks that this is going to be my little pump. This is going to be my six, nine, like exactly. this kid has that sort of appeal and he, you know, he did have some appeal, but it didn't really pan out to be the kind of thing that he probably wanted it to be. But I think when you follow an artist like that, it, the more specific you can get in his story, mm. it also, it becomes universal because there are so many people who have been chasing the dragon of rap stardom and, most of them don't make it mm. like most i mean even most of the rappers who have oh, sat yeah. with you like yeah. they might have a they might have a split second of notoriety of fame they might have one hit they might have half a hit mm. they might have three hits but that's not a career yeah and then what do they do and to me i've always wanted to bring this to my coverage like i write about pop stars i write about rappers i write about rock bands 
but I want to know what happens after somebody goes viral. Mm. Like after people stop paying attention, then what? Right. What What's the vibe with you and these street dudes? Somebody like Marlo, when it's just you and him driving around, is he mostly telling you about himself? Is he asking you about your life at all? And then once you're around 10 dudes like this, are you just like a fly on the wall where they're basically wrapped up in their own fucking universe? It's very fly on the wall. I think, you know, somewhere like Atlanta, which has had such a vibrant music scene for so long, you you know this, I, you know, I walk around the mall with these guys and, and then it's assumed that I'm somebody's manager or somebody's A&R okay, yeah. I'm from the label. I'm from the fader, you know, I'm from no jumper, <laughs> right. like, 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 and I write about this in the book and I don't name myself specifically, but it's built into the thing. There's always been white guys on the periphery of hip hop, whether it's a DJ, a writer, a photographer, a mm. video director, a label executive. And, and it's a symbiotic relationship. I'm getting something out of it. You're getting something out of it. Hopefully it's not exploitative. Hopefully you're not going to end up a culture vulture, which mm -hmm. I know, you know, probably both of us have been accused of at various points in our career. Right. But I think if you continue to show that you're engaged and interested in the art and you care about these people and what they have to say, and also you want to use whatever platform you have, whether it's a podcast or a newspaper or a book deal to shine a light on something that is legitimately important. Mm -hmm. Like this world, th like there's no more impactful music culture over the last 10, 20 years right. than what these guys are doing. So we might as well put a fucking microscope to it, put a spotlight on it. And and I think people got that right away. They right. were like, you you really want to see where we live, you know? And, I, and when I go down there now, even though I'm not reporting anymore, I run into people and they say, oh, like, Joe came to Bankhead. Joe came to Bowen Homestead. Mm. Not to, like, shoot some, you know sensationalized like ooh look at look at this poverty look at these the hood guns. vlogs are already a cliche the you hood know? vlogs are already a cliche but if you want to actually spend time there and get to know people and hear their stories like mm. people respond to that they everyone just wants to be listened to and acknowledged especially when they're doing something that's important right i know that you had a lot of shit that you saw that you were conflicted about whether it should be printed or not there's a lot of stuff that you were privy to. And there was some stuff that made it into the book that I was a little bit surprised by. But what's your mentality on that? When you're, you know, hearing people talk about violence or drugs or cr criminality, all kinds of stuff that realistically, you know, you could be putting somebody in danger by documenting it. Like, what, tell me about what it's like making these decisions. I mean, obviously, I thought about it every day. I thought about it every time I sat down to write. I talked a lot about it with my editors, with my friends, you know, with lawyers. Uh but I think at the end of the day, like if you're a journalist, if you're a reporter in the sense of, you know, you don't work for anybody else. It's not an authorized tale. Nobody signed off on this stuff. I wrote what I saw and mm. I felt like that is that is worthwhile because it is true. And I think ultimately, especially with social media, there's very little that I'm uncovering that mm. people don't already know. You know, someone But by asks, being around them, you definitely could uncover a lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be able to find out from just being on YouTube, right? I think that's true to an extent, but if you go back and think of something like the YSL indictment, if and, and you read the court papers now and you watch the hearings, and then you go back to YouTube videos that were published two years ago, and that shit is already laid out. The right, case is yeah. there. Like, when people say, oh, are you dry snitching? Like, are you going to get these people in trouble? Trouble. I'm like, you don't think the cops are on Reddit? Mm. Like, you don't think the cops have fake accounts and are on, on people's Instagram stories? Like, right. people are not exactly discreet. Some people are. You know, there there are people who you would never be able to to tell their business just by lurking online. But so much of today's culture, in rap and beyond, people are telling on themselves. People are documenting one another. Mm. Like, I just think. What I did was like I put it all in one place. Right. But I, what I think I also did was provide context yeah. and and humanity and reality. So it's not just YouTube montage of gun, 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 lean. Right. You know, I'm I'm talking about who these people are, where they come from, and why they've made the choices that they've made. So I think hopefully what what when you take all of that into account, you're you're learning about you're learning about humans. You're not just like finding scant little scandals. Right. Yeah. No, you definitely uh, humanize everybody in this this book so much. All right, people, we just hit 300,000 subscribers. You know we're trying to hit 400,000 subscribers. So that little red button, tap it, tap in. Appreciate y'all.